Hi there, I'm Jennifer Morrissey, Executive Director of the Mission Trails Regional Park Foundation, and I wanted to welcome you to the evening's presentation. It's the first of our new online series called On Topic. But before we get started, I wanted to just give you some background on the foundation. We were founded in 1988 as a 501c3 nonprofit to support Mission Trails Regional Park. And we do this by raising funds to support the park's needs from purchasing plants and tools for habitat restoration and trail maintenance uh, to contributing to major projects around the park, including the building of the visitor center, which opened in 1995, and the new ranger station in the East Fortuna staging area, which opened earlier this year. Um, as I just wanted to uh, let, uh, ask you to uh, consider making a gift to the Mission Trails Regional Park Foundation and supporting Mission Trails Park uh, when you do your charitable giving, um, whenever that may be. And you can also support us by um, making purchases through our new online gift shop, which is at MTRP, it's the mtrpstore.org. Um, okay, so tonight's speaker, Don Endicott. Um, he's a wonderful man and, and uh, very much a part of the Mission Trails Regional Park community. Um, I wanted to thank him for um, being the first speaker of this series. And then also uh, two supporters of this series, SDG&E, a longtime educational partner of ours, and Fight and City Entertainment. Our friends here are helping us with the technical aspects of this evening's talk. Uh, so Don Endicott, he is a retired research engineer who discovered a second career as a volunteer naturalist. Don is a certified interpretive guide, a Mission Trails Regional Park trail guide, and serves on the San Diego Humane Society's BAT team. In, in addition to presenting talks throughout Southern California, Don is an avid hiker and climber and co-authored a book called 50 Best Short Hikes San Diego. Don, thank you so much for um, presenting tonight. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, welcome everyone to Again, the inaugural uh, presentation in this series, a little bit of BATS 101. What a great opportunity. Glad you're all here, virtually at least. Uh, I do want to note that this is BAT Week, International BAT Week. So I'm in costume only for the introduction here. This is a little gift from my wife, and or my daughter actually. And uh, I tend to use that when I do school groups or sometimes my campfire talk. So let me shed my wings. I never get much air this way. Uh, what we're going to do at first is I'm going to show you a few features of that. And then we're going to walk through some slides. They have some animations. They have some sound. At about the 40, 45 minute point, we plan to uh, have a question an answer period. And then uh, I have at least three videos we'll see on timing. And I'll stick around at the end if there are any additional questions. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to a big brown bat. Now this is not to scale, but it allows me to show that bats, which are in the family Chiroptera, which means hand wing, are actually uh, they fly with their hands. So they're the only mammal that truly flies. The structure, I'm a little trouble here with the camera, but the structure is these are their leading, these two fingers. This is a thumb, small fingers. And again, they fly with their hands. Now I said not to scale. Actually a big bat is about this size. So this is considered one of the larger bats. Um, and we'll see some of these in flight in a little bit. Uh, one other thing I want to do before I get into the slides is make a recommendation. Uh, if you want to know about the local bats, the best opportunity is, uh, resource anyway, is the San Diego County Mammal Atlas. It's put out by the Natural History Museum. It has a fantastic chapter on all the bats that are found in San Diego County, uh, written by Drew Stokes, a friend and associate. Uh, in addition, for you hobbyists, there's a little book called Beginner's Guide to Bats. It's called The Stokes Guide. All of $10 will fit in your pocket. Highly recommend that one to take along. I use that when I'm doing bat walk. So with that, let's go to our slides. 
and hopefully everyone can now see the amazing world of bats, nature's tiny fighter jets. So I start my campfire talks and school group uh, presentations with a quiz. So we're gonna do a quiz here, the next one. These are a true and false. Now I can't hear you shout out the answer, so I'll, I'll help you out, but often I hear bats are blind. Bats will attack you. Bats will get in your hair. Bats will suck your blood. All bats have rabies. Bats aren't important to us. They're vermin or they're, they're problems. But in fact, all of these are false. Bats can see perfectly well, some better than others, especially the California leaf nose bat. Uh, it has pretty good night vision, very good night vision, but it's not an advantage if you're flying in the dark. So we'll hear more about how they navigate and hunt. Bats will attack you. Um, the only bat that might come in contact, none in North America, are vampire bats. And that's not really an attack, but we might talk about that in a question period. Bats will get in your hair. No, they're not trying to get in your hair. Again, vampire bat, one species of bat out of over 1,300 actually will uh, draw blood. Uh, all bats have rabies. Bats, like other wild animals, do contract rabies. Um, about 70% of rabies cases are from bats, but those are very small numbers, maybe one to three cases a year in the US. And we'll hear why bats are important to us. So I already mentioned a mammal, the bats are the only mammals that can fly. They use sound echoes to navigate and hunt. They're warm blooded. They have hair on their bodies like any other mammal. Live birth, uh, babies nurse on the mother's milk. Although the, our, most of our bats catch insects, the mothers produce milk. That's what the babies grew up with. Already talked about Chiroptera. Look at that number at the bottom, over 1300 species worldwide. A quarter of all mammal species are bats. Where in the world do they live? Pretty much everywhere except the extreme Arctic and Antarctic, largely a tropical uh, animal. So there are larger numbers of species in the, in the tropics, more variety there as well. We hear some wonderful names like bald mouse, flying mouse. Of course, they're not rodents, they're not mice. They are their own family, bats. And then fantastic Old Norse leather flapper, perfect description. Already described a little bit with our big brown bat flying with their wings. Uh, their fingers, unlike birds, haven't fused. They've actually stretched out. So the fingers are much longer. You can see the anatomy there on the, on the right of this figure, thumb up. Uh, the first two fingers, they make kind of the leading edge of their air, the airfoil of their wing and pinky. Uh, on the left side, we see body parts. So again, all the parts of an, a mammal. Uh, some of them have the tail membrane that goes straight across and the tails encased, some extend. So the free tail bats, like Mexican or Brazilian free tail bats, that tail extends outward. One unique thing about bats anatomy, different from us, is their legs are actually rotated 180 degrees away from ours. So think of your knees bending backward if you were standing up. If we were in a campfire setting or a classroom, I'd ask, well, why is that? Well, think about how they hang. And if their feet face the other direction, how could they hang and fly out from their, their evening or, or day roosts? So a very important adaptation. So wings, the signature feature. They've got a juvenile pallid bat on the left side. Uh, this is a Mexican free-tailed. Again, a Brazilian free-tailed bat on the right. You can see that structure with the extended wings. Um, I can't show, I can't really highlight the, those features with my mouse, but I believe you can see them. That membrane is sort of about the consistency of a thick latex, think of a latex glove, but it's interwoven with all sorts of tendons and structure, blood vessels. And we'll see in flight what, what that flexibility allows them to do. Uh, their head, very specialized. Again, they're uh, echolocating. Uh, they have some adaptations uh, for 
making sound, processing sound. But this is our pallid bat again, which we have both coastal and desert varieties. They have a very strong bite. And we'll hear a little bit about more about that later on. Uh, on one of my mission trails walks, I had a neuroscientist who was along on that hike. She said she'd love to get a CT scan of a bat. And one thing led to another, and we produced this little video on the right. So this is a pallid bat, same species on the left. This is a skull, not the actual bat, uh, from the Natural History Museum. So let's see how that rotates for you. You can see the densest parts are in the, in the teeth and the jaws, and then in the cochlea, the, the processing part of the, the uh, inner ear and the outer ear. Well, actually all the inner ear. So that's a pallid bat skull. They have one of the strongest bites, uh, certainly of our local bats. How big are they? Well, most of them are tiny. Uh, they would fit in the palm of your hand. On the upper right, I have a canyon bat. That's one of our more common bats, uh, about the size of two quarters. They weigh about the same as a Hershey's Kiss. And I have a specimen here. I know my picture is awfully small in the frame, but this is, this is a canyon bat. And so maybe we can tilt this a little bit and see how tiny they really are. That's our smallest. Um, we also have, whoops, I wanted to go back here. We also have as common species, Mexican free tail and the Yuma myotis. Yuma myotis often seen around ponds in San Diego, in mission trails. That's one that you will see shortly after dark at the old mission dam. Uh, canyon bats are the first ones out, and we also see those at the uh, old mission trails down. They'll be out before it gets dark. Okay, we have 22 species in the county, 44 to 45, depending on some that bump up into the uh, Florida uh, in the country, in North America, actually. And these are some of our locals and their sizes. So again, quite small, except for the mastiff bat. And if you take a look at this, this is a display from the Natural History Museum. We here in the county have the largest bat in North America, the Western Mastiff bat, that's in the top of the frame, and the canyon bat, the little guy that I was just showing you. And these are some of the other common bats in our area. What color are bats? Well, bats are mostly black, brown, some grayish. Uh, sometimes we, we joke L, LBJs, little brown jobs, but we have some very colorful ones. The pallid bat on the upper right, obviously a nice white color. That's the desert variety. Here on the coast, we also have pallid bats more toward the foothills um, and they're a little more uh, brownish. A Western red bat, gorgeous little bat and the hoary bat, which uh, some of us think that's the designer bat with that lovely frosting. And here are those three, uh, and along with the yellow bat, side by side, hoary bat, western red bat, and yellow bat. They're all in the genus Lazarus. Uh, and let's see, next I wanna talk about fossils. So bats have been around a very long time. The, the fossil on the left aged to 52 million years ago. I recall birds have been around about 140 million years. So bats came later, obviously evolved separately and not from reptiles, from mammals. And so it's they're from the very beginning of the age of mammals and they look substantially like they do now. You could easily recognize that figure on the left as a bat. Flight, they're the only mammals capable of flight. Think of sugar gliders, flight, uh, flying squirrels. They glide, they do not fly. Uh, and evolved independently of birds. Some of them are really have trouble in, in rigorous conditions. Our canyon bats, if it's windy out, boy, they're just flopping all over the place. Mexican free tails, greyhounds of the sky. They might fly 35, 45 miles or more each night to forage. They might do that a couple of times. And we'll see a little bit more about them in a moment. Very high metabolism. Most of the bats, Mexican free bat, tail bats, a good example, eat their body weight in insects every night. So getting to what do they eat? Most of our bats are insectivores. 
uh, we have here on the right moth eaters. Uh, we do have a couple of nectar uh, bats. They come here. They're fairly uncommon here, more common in Mexico, uh, southern Arizona, et cetera. They're nectar feeders and pollinators. And then our pallid bat, one of my favorites, this bat actually hunts on the ground and captures scorpions, centipedes, uh, Jerusalem crickets. And I have a little video at the end showing that they are immune to scorpion venom. How do bats drink? I got this question when I was giving a presentation at uh, Cabrillo National Monument from a young man, I think a junior high schooler, and I didn't know. So I love getting questions at these talks. Uh, they drink by flying over the water and dipping their tongues in. Some, sometimes they'll dip their, their belly fur in the water and then lap that up later. And they'll keep coming back until they get their fill of water. It's no advantage to be on the ground at any time if you're a bat because that just means you're now prey. So these are some photographs taken in our local mountains. And I'll do a shout out to Charlie Van Tassel who's my mentor for bat photography. So echolocation, I've talked seeing with sound. So this is Lily. Lily unfortunately has passed on, but Lily was one of our ambassador bats with Project Wildlife, part of the San Diego Humane Society. Lily was a yellow bat, Western yellow bat. And we were doing an outreach program. I think it was up at San Alijo. And I noticed that her mouth was going and I put my recorder. Let's see if we can get a little sound here. I'll turn it up. So we're going to talk about that in a little in a moment, but echolocation, they're actually squeaking at very high frequency. We couldn't possibly hear that. The yellow bat's about 30 kilohertz, uh, 30 to 35. Some of them go all up into over 100 kilohertz. There are a few species that are audible to humans, uh, but mostly they're out of our range. So to our world, they're totally silent. To their world, they're making quite a bit of clicking, listening for echoes. And that was, this is what that looks like. So here on the left, we see the bat calling out and then listening for the echo. So if it's navigating, it's got one kind of call. If it's hunting, it will be a different, usually a different frequency, a little higher pitch. It'll be appropriate to the size of the prey. And then as they get very close to the, the insect, we'll start hearing what's called a feeding buzz. So I uh, often ask, well, how loud is it? We can't hear anything. It's a good thing we can't hear anything because if we could, it would be just a racket. We'd uh, have earmuffs on all the time. A hundred plus decibels and uh, maybe even to 140. So imagine bats flying out at night and their calls are sounding like jet aircraft taking off. We're not even sure how they can tolerate that much sound from their neighbors calling. The good news is that their range isn't very long. Uh, but another mechanism they have, adaptation, is they actually squeeze the muscles around their inner ear bones so that they separate and can't hear their own calls going out so they don't self-deafen. So I mentioned tighter fi tiny fighter jets in the, in the uh, title to this talk. Several reasons for giving them that uh, moniker. Their sonar, the echolocation sound navigation is much more capable than anything we've ever developed. They're able to hover, listening for prey. We've got the Mexican free-tailed bats that have been radio tagged and are, it's possible for them to travel up to 100 miles an hour in level flight. That was a discovery only a few years ago. Put some tags on, followed it in an airplane. They can also fly up to 10,000 feet. And in Texas, they go up in swarms to catch uh, migrating moths. And I have a little video of that later too. And that bottom one, they even have jamming. That was another recent discovery that sometimes the bats will put out a call to distract someone while they zoom in and get that bit of food. Life cycle. Uh, bat babies, that's again, they're placental mammals, uh, born blind and hairless. 
usually one per mother, but with Western red bats, there can be up to four. And look at that second line. They can weigh a quarter or more the weight of the mother. I still haven't figured out how a Western red bat can possibly carry four babies and still be able to fly before they're born. Most of the species learn to fly in four to six weeks, and then they're on their own. Up to that point, uh, they're feeding on their mother's milk. Mothers go out and forage, come back, feed their young, go out and forage again, feed their young. Uh, some of that, I forget the statistic, but some of like their, their milk is 30% body fat, uh, milk fat, so very rich. Some bats hibernate in caves, mine shafts, in our colder climates here. The bats that we have might go into torpor during cold spells. Some of them might migrate, but generally they've got it pretty good in San Diego. They can also live surprisingly long, 20 to 40 years. I think the record was 43, 44 years. A number of our bats will live 15 years. Think about that compared to a rodent, which is the same size. They're lucky to live more than a year. So maternity colonies, nurseries. Uh, you'll see that I've used Mexican free tail and Brazilian free tail here. It's the same species, Caderita brasiliensis. Um, but at one time they were thought to be two different kinds because the ones on the East Coast hibernate and the ones on the West Coast migrate but genetic studies show that they're the same. But when they have their nursery colonies, they're packed in up to 500 pups per square foot. Uh, in one cave in Texas, Bracken Cave, in the spring, 20 million mothers, 20 million babies. It's the densest concentration of mammals in the world in that, during that period. I mentioned hibernation. Uh, our, our, our bats don't tend to hibernate, but those in those areas, especially back in the east, the Midwest, bats are even up in, in the Can Canadian Rockies, uh, up to as far as Alaska. Uh, they lower their temperatures. They lower their metabolism basically to nothing. And you can see that bottom statistic it can stop breathing for up to 48 minutes. So they really reduce everything non-essential can lower the body temperatures below freezing so they can get through the winter and get back to a time when there's food. So that's in the spring. We'll talk a little bit about white nose syndrome and how that's affecting some of the, these hibernacula. A little closer to home, San Diego County bat species. I mentioned there are 22. I won't go through the whole list. The ones in bold are a bit more common than some of the others. I should bold pallid bats. There's quite a few of those. I have a little cute thing on the right here. Uh, I started doing tallies. So some of you have been to the visitor center on mission trails. You've seen the photo. Uh, I have one later in the program of a Townsend's bigger bat. That was just discovered a couple of years ago. But there in my backyard with acoustic sampling up to, I've now detected in just a few years, half of the species in the county. So they're around, even though we don't notice them. And here's the rest of the list. Uh, and the leaf nose bats, the bottom two are actually pretty rare. So how do we detect bats acoustically? I'm going to give some examples. I know my picture is probably too small for this, but I'm going to hold up. This is, this is one of the microphones. This is an ultrasonic microphone. It's a commercial product. You can, this particular model, you can hook it to a cell phone and you can go out and record bats. The one on the right, I'm just showing with a tablet. That's how I started recording. Uh, and you can see on the display their call. So we'll go look at a couple of those. This, this is built in software. So you're looking at what's called a spectrogram. Here's one for Yuma myotis. This is a common species it's around San Diego. Again, it's going to be seen at the Old Mission Dam. Uh, it's called a 50 kilohertz bat. So I'm going to orient you to this plot. Uh, time in thousandths of a second along the horizontal and frequency in thousandths of a cycle kilohertz on the left side. The upper part shows power. And they would actually sound more like the static clicking if we could hear their frequency, but the processing allows us to have a little more favorable sound. Uh, 
Okay, so a couple of things about this. Again, this is a this is lowered in frequency so we can hear it. It's slowed down so we can hear it, and it's modulated. It's got signal processing so that instead of hearing static, we get this sort of uh, I guess not exactly musical, but these tones. And when when I'm in the field, I can listen to my recorder and identify the species without even having to look at at the plots. So this is a 50 kilohertz bat, Juma myotis. The next one is a canyon bat. And these are our little bitty guys, the one I held up in my hand. Uh, they're sort of, uh, they're at 45 kilohertz and they're pretty much like a metronome. So let's hear that. Very regular, almost like a heartbeat. Now we're going lower in frequency. This is the Western yellow bat. So remember we went, we met Lily a little while ago. So Lily's down at 30 to 35 kilohertz. And finally, Mexican free tail bats. So these guys are really loud. They're the at 120 to 140 decibels. Uh, if they're around, you'll hear them. And I like to compare this to uh, a submarine, a World War II submarine movie. Now, Mexican free tail bats have a very, very, a highly varied diet, small insects large insects. Consequently, their calls have a lot of variety. Unlike birds, bats calls, although they can, and many times we can identify them acoustically, but they're serving a function. They're not an identification. Birds call to announce, you know, I'm a, a uh, lesser goldfinch. I'm a male. I have a territory. I'm available. Bats call say, I'm hunting moths. I'm hunting mosquitoes. I'm navigating in a forest. I'm navigating out over open space. So very different application of sound. And what I wanted to show here is the pallid bat, again, we'll have a little video on this, is a gleaning bat. It's one that listens more than it calls and listens for echo. So this is the ground hunter. This is the bat that will hunt and capture scorpions on the ground. Large sheared bats, tend to be quieter bats. So I, I just showed one plot here, same scale as before, and I had to multiply it 10x to be able to see what that power spectrum at the top is. And sometimes it's a party. Bats forage on different insects, they forage at different times. They guess basically get along with each other in, your, in an interspecies sense. So this is out in Anza Borrego, uh, near the campground in Borrego Palm Canyon three species at once. And you can see them all flying together too, all hunting slightly different food. So bats in human culture, creatures of the night, uh, fear, death, all sorts of associations with bats, largely because of the mystery. I mean, we don't know too much about them. We can barely get glimpses of them, didn't really know their habits. But that wasn't always the case uh, or isn't hasn't been always the case. On the far right, I have Valencia, Spain. They were having insect infestations, a plague. Uh, bats came in, saved the crops, and as a consequence, they uh, honored and recognized the bats and put them right on the seal of the, their coat of arms. And here in the next slide, the second from the upper left, it's on their soccer team's logo. Of course, we have all sorts of different cultural inferences, Dracula, um, we have Batman, none of these true bats. We have Stella Luna with uh, Janelle, one of a local well-known author's favorite book for children. On the middle bottom, I'm showing the Chinese had a rather different uh, attitude about bats. They think of them as, as good fortune. Uh, you'll often see five bat artifacts. So, Left to right, I've got a ceramic, got five bats around the rim. Uh, we have the five bat coin. Uh, that tapestry has the five golden bats. The coin, the five bat theme is uh, 
called Wu Fu. It's a, a palinome. It's where uh, the word means uh, the good fortune, but it also means bat. And those five baths, different interpretations, but health, wealth, long life, good luck, and tranquility. And what a what a, a great uh, great way to express your your feelings about bats. Getting on the home stretch here, how do bats benefit us? Well, insect control. In Texas, outside Bracken Cave, it's estimated those bats in the spring catch about 175 tons of moths that are out to forage on the fields every night. That's a lot of insect control. So I don't know how they did it, but someone measured a little brown bat catching a thousand mosquitoes an hour. How could you have better insect control than that, and mosquito control? Pollinate plants. Although we have a few nectar, uh, nectar feeding bats, but in areas where they do exist, uh, they were the primary pollinators for the original banana, guava, papaya. Um, so fruits that we take, it, uh, take for uh, granted are bat pollinated. In addition, the, um, I was going to say, we have fruit eating bats and they disperse seeds. So these fruit eating bats kind of make a mess of it up in their trees when they go forage on fruit. We don't have any here. Uh, but then when they fly and drop the seeds in, the, in rainforest areas, bats are often one of the primary, if not the primary source of reforestation. Medical research. One that's kind of a uh, little fun trivia fact is uh, vampire bats, again, we don't have any, but uh, they, ha they have an anticoagulant in their blood. So that's being been studied for possible use in medical, in surgeries. In addition, bats are very disease free, still trying to understand how that's done. Um, part of it is chemical. Some of it is mechanism where they can isolate uh, infections and such. Uh, as part of it is a, a, actually a gene that allows them to be resistant. So that's another course of study is how can they, and that's a reason for long life, by the way, one of the reasons for long life. Uh, it's thought to have originated with or be associated with flying, the heat, the high metabolism, and needing to avoid things that would slow them down. So that's the medical research. And back in the day, not so much anymore, they were a very important source of, of guano and, and fertilizer. So threats, uh, just like all wildlife, loss, loss of habitat, especially loss of foraging habitat. Some of you may have heard of some very serious concerns about declines in insect populations, which affects the entire food chain. Uh, destruction of roost sites. Uh, here are Western yellow bats in this, their, their nurseries are in palm, free, palm uh, trees. So places that might, uh, you know, tree trimming, et cetera, is, is an issue there, but also just construction areas where bats have lived historically. Pesticides, DDT, back in the day, uh, but anything that gets into the food chain. Intentionally killed, I mean, they were shot, burned, uh, I've heard of mines and caves where they resident being uh, intentionally blasted because they didn't want the bats. Uh, white nose syndrome, a fungus, talk about that in a moment. And wind turbines. Uh, wind turbines apparently attract some species. The hoary bat is the one in particular over in the lower right there, Merlin Tuttle, very well respected, a long time bat researcher with some bats at a windmill farm. So there are efforts underway to put basically acoustic deflectors to discourage the bats that uh, for some reason are attracted to the, the sound of the rotating blades. And we have foraging. This is a, an acquaintance up from uh, Pinnacles National Park who happened to see Swainson's hawk out after Mexican free tails. Uh, they don't catch very many, fortunately, but just enough to keep them hunt, filled. Mentioned white nose uh, syndrome. Uh, this is a fungus introduced in New York back in 2006, thought to be come in from cavers. 
and it's propagating across the country. This map is actually a couple of years old. There's one site up in Northern California. I know it's in Washington State. <clears throat> the, the problem, I think I have a picture. I don't, let me go back one if I can. I'll go up here. On the upper right, we can see that little white growth. These are little brown bats. This is a species particularly hard hit uh, by white nose. Uh, it, it forms on their noses, as you can see, other their body parts. The main uh, mechanism affecting the bats, though, is it causes them to wake up during hibernation. And, and I've read that just one moment of being raised out of your hibernation torpor, the, the lower body temperature at all, can use up a week or two of, of food supply. And basically, they starve by, before the, the winter is over. Many studies across the country, different universities trying to find out some bats are resistant, some aren't. Uh, are there any treatments, topical or otherwise, that could be applied? It's so serious, it's considered perhaps the largest ec extinction mechanism of our time. There are bat colonies that have been around for millennia, 100% wiped out, no survivors. Uh, so very big concern. So field techniques, how do we find out about bats? I showed you a little bit about acoustic monitoring. Uh, another technique is called mist netting. This is sort of look like volleyball nets, set them up at night in flyways. Uh, biologists extract them from the nest. I mean, to be on a foraging path, uh, might weigh them, sample them, blood samples. Uh, it's a way to do census, et cetera. Try not to do that very often. We don't want to do invasive monitoring, don't want to impede the bats. And then roost surveys. So you can see on the center right, that's a Townsend's Big Eared Bat up in our local mountains. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment too. But uh, one thing about bat surveys now, because of white nose syndrome, you have to take extra precaution, uh, almost like being in uh, surgical bunny suits, et cetera, in some of the sites to keep uh, any chance of that infection uh, advancing. How to be a friend of bats. So helping protect natural habitat is good for all of our critters. Uh, certainly avoid disturbing bats if possible. Uh, going into mines is not exactly a safe thing to do and bats that use them, especially Townsend's Big Ear, if there's too much foot traffic they may abandon a, a, a site that they've used for, for decades or longer. I already mentioned, please minimize trimming of your palm trees in the, in the spring and early summer. Uh, pet cats are a big problem. Uh, one of the major sources of injury for bats that we get at Project Wildlife. Uh, I know there's swimming pools. So one thing that we advise if you do have bats in your area and you start seeing bats that have fallen in the water, make what's called a little frog log, make a little ramp so they can get out. There are bat organizations that have advice. Bat Conservation International is a, is a good one to look up. And San Diego Project Wildlife mentioned I'm on the bat team. I actually do public outreach and, and documentation. I'm not a rehabber, but uh, bats that come in can be rehabilitated and wherever possible released. And that's what you see on the right. It's a Townsend's <clears throat> big eared bat and the gloved hand. And uh, I think Cindy's holding it there in the, in the center photo here. That was up by Escondido. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more. Uh, you can't keep pet bats. The Project Wildlife's effort is to permit with Department of Fish and Wildlife and there's uh, quite a, an orientation and such to be engaged in this work. But I left the number there. You can just, you can also Google, get it through the San Diego Humane Society. If you find a bat on the ground, this is a good time to mention that, you certainly don't want to touch it with your hands. Uh, you, can, uh, you can call uh, and we can come out and help recover it. Or if you want to protect it from say a, a cat or something like that, Shoebox, cardboard, wear gloves. I uh, certainly don't want uh, children touching that. One of the things I, I should also mention is because of the concern of rabies, 
uh, any contact between a human or touching a bat requires the bat to be tested for rabies. And unfortunately, that's a, that requires them to be euthanized and, and brain cell specimens taken. So definitely don't touch a bat for both your sake and the bats. Show a little bit of a release here. This is Cindy with a hoary bat back in 2019. Uh, it's so great to see these guys take off. And again, this is a this is a gorgeous bat. That's our designer bat. And there it goes. So Townsend's, I won't spend too much time because I want to leave uh, room for questions and such, but this has become my favorite bat. These guys are a threatened species in California. This is the species that with my recorder we detected in Mission Trails for the first time. Uh, adding to our mammal list, which is always pretty cool. The center top picture shows that in a cave, you don't even see those big ears. They roll them back. Might be for insulation, not sure. And so all that sticks out is the tragus, the center part. Uh, this is a bat that likes mines, natural caves, found throughout the Southwest, but in, in low numbers. And again, they're threatened. So I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, topic du jour, COVID. So bats are very disease resistant. Uh, they're natural hosts. They don't get sick the way we do. And some of the coronaviruses are very similar to SARS-CoV-19, which is the thing that's you know, wreaking havoc in our lives. Uh, other, other wildlife can be hosts of coronavirus, but bats are not carriers of COVID, the disease that we're getting and you can't catch COVID from a bat. In fact, what we're more worried about is bats catching COVID from us because I haven't read yet of it being in native North American populations, but it's certainly not something we want to happen. So uh, there've been all sorts of new protocols for bi biology, biologists and field work with bats. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. We're still not sure how it got into the human, popu human population. I keep looking for research studies, et cetera, that uh, you know, we think there's still that possibility of uh, through an intermediate mammal. And uh, I guess stay tuned, we'll hear how that goes. But one thing about COVID and bats in any wildlife is if the bats are left undisturbed, they really are no threat to humans. It's when they're they're confined, they're stressed, they're in unnatural combinations with other animals. That's when we get in trouble. So everyone already passed the quiz and I can't hear you anyway. So we'll wrap up with, turn on the dark, I'm afraid of the light, Michelle Silverstein. And bats are even in Shakespeare. On the bat's back, I do fly after summer merrily from the Tempest. So with that, this is a time for questions and we're gonna try to do this live. Um, I, we've had Jennifer running some chats. Uh, I would like to, I'll take, I see we have three questions, so I'll take them one at a time. Uh, then if there are no more questions, we'll shift to the videos and we can have some, some wrap up. So I see we still have about 15 minutes. So first question. If we weren't in a pandemic, would this be a live lecture and walking tour? I want to see some bats. Absolutely, I much prefer that. Um, I do that with Mission Trails in the evening, the, sometimes just with the regular twilight walks. I've also organized some, some just bat themed talks, very popular. Um, I give campfire talks. Of course, that can't happen now, but out at Brago Palm Canyon. So a monthly talk, either mountain lions or bats. And I especially like giving the bat talks because we have bats flying around. People can see them, they can hear them. That's very cool. Um, so stay tuned. Post COVID, hopefully I'm around and certainly uh, really love that opportunity, especially if there are kids involved. And, uh, hand them a recorder and let them start pointing it at bats. Okay, question number two. I set up a bat box at the beginning of summer. I haven't seen any yet. Is it too late in the season now? I understand it could take years for them to show up. 
Um, well, you certainly understand the bat box situation. So bats are creatures of habit. Uh, they may or may not like where your bat box is. Sometimes it's just the case of moving it to the other side of the building. They're very, uh, I guess, attuned to temperature. So sometimes the bat box might be too hot or it might be too cold. Bats like warm environments. Uh, but one thing to remember about bats, given how long they live, is if they take over a bat box, it's sort of, you know, for life. You're, you really should be planning on maintaining that bat box for decades, because if you're successful, they're going to be relying on it. Uh, for bat boxes, I actually have a slide, I think, at the end for some might who not know what that they look like. So that's a bat box. Um, Bat Conservation International has some excellent designs. Uh, color matters, and they have maps that showing the color that you should use for your neighborhood, or at least your, your region. Uh, black is for colder areas, and lighter colors are for warmer areas. Uh, it, and let's see, next question. Oops, I gotta scroll up. Thank you for the question. This is the best part of my talk. Um, and by the way, wrapping that up, yes, it could take years for them to show up. I have a friend who has two bat boxes. He lives up, he has a cabin in the mountains, one bat box on each end. One side has never had any bats. The other one has, I think, uh, several hundred bats in it. Uh, is there anything we can do to attract bats to our yards and neighborhoods? Um, if you've got insects, uh, they'll be around. I've lived in our house since 1986. I'm in Scripps Ranch. Did not know we had bats. When I got my first bat recorder, I walked out the front door and I, I mean, it was literally seconds after walking the door. I go, oh, I've got Eumomyotis here. So they're already around. You might not have noticed them yet. Uh, I guess you could feed them mosquitoes, but not a good recommendation. Let's see, next one, I teach at Lewis Middle School eighth grade science unit on identifying bats to their echolocation. Would you be willing to share your resources? Absolutely. Uh, you can contact me through Jennifer and the foundation. Uh, I should have mentioned in the county uh, mammal atlas, Drew's section, each species listed has a little synopsis of their echolocation characteristics. Very handy. Is a chupacabra a bat? I'm sorry with that one. I don't, I'm not familiar with what a chupacabra is, but uh, I'll look it up now. What other mammals use echolocation? Are the cetaceans, whales, dolphins, uh, killer whales, they use a different mechanism. They, um, there's something called the melon, of course they're in water, so it's a very different uh, a medium to, to echolocate. But same idea, they're sending out sound and listening for it to come back. Uh, I think there's somebody, one other type. I know sometimes some species issue calls that are that loud, are at those frequencies, shrews do, even uh, uh, house rats make squeaks up in those ranges, but I, I don't really know that they're navigating. Next question, this is a great one. Can moths and insects hear the bat sound? Absolutely. Uh, they're in kind of this evolutionary arms race. Uh, some bat, some moths hear the bats and they'll drop to the ground. Uh, some insects uh, put out sounds that, that inform that I'm a species you don't want to eat because they taste bad. So yeah, they're, they're very much an awareness, maybe not consciously, but Physiologically, they're, they're aware of each other. There is, there was a recent special, maybe a year ago, it's, uh, I think it was on nature, sex lives and butterflies. And uh, one of the hypotheses is that butterflies evolved from moths to avoid bats. And I'm looking for a second source on that, but that's pretty, pretty wild. Let's see, can we, let's see. Do any species migrate? Yes, hoary bats migrate, Western or uh, Mexican free tails migrate. Uh, some of them can go quite a ways. 
the only native mammal to the Hawaiian Islands is the hoary bat, and they migrated from the mainland. Uh, I think fairly recently, I just saw something about that. 8,000 years ago and maybe 50,000. Anyway, look that up into the Hawaiian hoary bat migrated that far. Can you tell if a bat is a Dracula? Ooh, well, Dracula wasn't a bat, uh, but if I can tell a bat is a vampire bat, again, that's a bat that lives in Central, Central America and sort of central Mexico and south. Um, so yeah, you can identify bats by their characteristics. Are there species of bats that sleep beneath leaves or in hollow trees? Or just generally, where would a bat sleep in an area without caves or mines? Well, actually only a few species live in caves and mines. Uh, Mexican free tails live in caves, but they also live under bridges. So. The Interstate 15 bridge over Mercy Canyon near my home has Mexican free tails. There's a bridge up near Hemet that has a large colony of, of Mexican free tails. Hoary bats, western reds, they live in trees. Uh, silver bats also live in trees. Some of them live under bark. So uh, uh, canyon bats, they live under rocks out in the desert and crevices or crevice bats. So have a lot of, it depends on the species many different habitats and they've adapted to those but specifically beneath leaves or in hollow trees there are many bats that reside in in leaves in the tropics let's see i want to get on okay i see there are more questions but i think what i will do well okay two more we'll do those what kind of gear do you use for your photography um we could follow up later on the basic idea is a camera an ultrasonic or, or other form of trigger and four flashes. So the flashes are, are linked to the trigger and the camera. And so the bat basically takes its picture as it flies by. Uh, and the best place to do that is around water because you kind of can predict where they're going to be. If a bat gets a wing, brain, wing membrane injured, can it heal? Um, I've seen some scars on bats, so I guess to a degree, some of the bats that become education bats get injured just too much and they can't fly again. So um, yeah, I guess to a degree they can heal. Can bats hover? Some species absolutely. Um, Townsend figured sort of look like a little helicopter at times. The pallid bat can hover over the ground in place. And Okay, I think I'll see a little comment on Scotland. So at this point, what I would like to do is do a new share, show you three videos. We have five minutes. I think that'll work just about right. And I'll give it back to Jennifer at that point, and we can figure out if there's another one, any additional questions can be fielded. So at this point, I'm going to go turn on a video. The first video is going to be a big brown bat, the one we started out with was the puppet, uh, and see how they fly in slow motion. So let's see. going to pause this for a second to just point out a couple of things about this big brown bat. Uh, one thing is you'll see that it's flying with its mouth open. It's echolocating. So 
all that time it's flying, it's also putting out those calls. For some species, they found those calls can be up to, those squeaks can be vibrating maybe 200 times a second. Not sure how the muscles can move that fast. Another thing we saw, especially at the beginning, was how steady the bat's head was. Its body might be moving, its wings are, might be moving a lot, but its head is still sort of like a cheater on any other predator that allows it to stay focused on what it's heading for. And finally, you saw all the flexibility in the wings. So they can control their wings independently. They can turn on a dime. Uh, just incredible flyers. Okay, so one last comment about that before we do this next one is, um, and I get this asked a lot, well, what about those sharp teeth? And I, I usually turn that back as a question. The sharp teeth aren't to look ferocious. They're not out there in general catching other mammals, uh, though some do. Um, but think of what they're eating. They're hard shelled insects and that's how they penetrate those hard shells, those, those needle sharp teeth. So what I wanna do now, we're going to go listen to a pallet bat or see a pallet bat. Slicing through the shadows, scanning for prey hidden under a cloak of darkness. Bats are masters of the night sky thanks to their twin superpowers flight and echolocation using sound waves to find prey. So what the heck is this one doing? It's hunting on the ground and not flying. Kind of an undignified way to catch a meal, isn't it? I mean, for a bat. out echolocation that natural sonar bats use isn't the killer technique you think. Like it's not actually that sneaky. We can't hear the frequency that bats put out, but to a moth, it's louder than a scream. More like a jet taking off. It's kind of a dead giveaway. And some prey have found ways to fight back. This tiger moth is loaded up on a diet of toxic plants that make him disgusting to eat. A fact he broadcasts with morning clicks from an organ called a timbal. The same one cicadas used to sing. Bats learn as pups to stay away. And these hawk moths can scramble bat sonar by emitting clicks from their genitals. It's a dogfight that bats are starting to lose. That's why some, like this pallet bat, are changing the game. She still echolocates, but only to navigate. And she keeps the volume low. She's a whispering bat. When it's time to hunt, she goes into stealth mode. Her ears point down where scorpions and crickets are milling in the loose earth. And she listens. Look at those ears again. They're huge relative to her tiny skull. They do a great job of capturing and amplifying sound especially the low-pitched noises of scurrying prey. And see that funny flap? It's called the tragus. They provide extra information about where a sound is coming from. We have them too, but in a bat, they're way bigger. And the bat has a final card to play here. She's immune to scorpion venom. This game rattles her a little. It 
just not as graceful as the high-flying aerobatics. But hey, it works. A lot of people really don't like bats, but they do us a favor by eating tons of mosquitoes. Watch our video about how mosquitoes use six separate... Okay, um, let's see, I'm looking for, I see I've gone past seven o'clock. Uh, we're going to do a close on the show, I guess, a little bit. Um, and I'm, I'm looking for some signals here, sorry. Uh, I have one more video, but I think we've run out of time. So maybe I can point to some websites for additional information. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing so we can go back to a wrap up. Go back to you, Jennifer.